You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about that hit BBC series, Doctor Who, of course. Today we're discussing the 12th Doctor story, Before the Flood. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel is Father Corey Stika. Hey, Father. How's it going? Very well, thanks. Uh, Jimmy couldn't join us again this week, but uh, he'll be back soon. So uh, he'll be back next time, I hope. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, we'll look forward to having him join us again. Folks, before uh, before we get to our show, I want to encourage you to go to Apple Podcasts or any place where you can write a review or give a rating and, and do so for this show. That really helps a lot. You'd, you'd be surprised at how important that is for a show. Also, Share the podcast with your friends. Help us grow this community of Doctor Who fans and reach ever more listeners. We, we, the number one way we grow is by you sharing it with others. I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you are sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Star Wars. You can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Star Wars. All right. Well, it's... Uh, before the flood, this is the second of a two-parter that we've been discussing. Last time we talked about uh, under the lake, and this is before the flood. And so, since Jimmy's not here, it's my turn to do the recap. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Hmm. <laughs> I always want to play good. that. <laughs> always good. <laughs> All right, picking up from where we left off with the Doctor's ghost in the twenty-second century. The Doctor, Bennett, and O'Donnell have gone back to 1980 before the lake was flooded. They meet the Tivolian funeral director, who's now a ghost in the 22nd century, and find the spaceship hearse with the Fisher King's body inside. But then the Tivolian is killed by the not-quite-dead Fisher King. He's only mostly dead. Mm. Then O'Donnell, uh, and then he kills O'Donnell. Warned by Clara about his ghost and its messages, the Doctor knows that after O'Donnell dies, Clara is next. He tries to change the future by saving Clara, but ends up looping on his own timeline. The Doctor confronts the Fisher King, tells him he's already changed the future by erasing those words inside the spaceship hearse. And the Fisher King, in a rage, rushes to his spaceship, but the Doctor has set a trap, destroying the dam, flooding the valley, killing the Fisher King. And then the TARDIS, without the Doctor aboard, takes Bennett back to the future. Marty, get back to the future! <laughs> while, while the Doctor survives the flood in the suspended animation chamber. Clara, Cass, and Lun have been running back uh, around from the ghosts and uh, on board the uh, mining station under the lake. And eventually arrive in the hangar, where the suspended animation chamber is, from which the Doctor emerges. His hologram ghost doctor roars the Fisher King roar in the Faraday cage, drawing the ghosts there, locking them in. Bob's your uncle. Problem solved. Except it's all a bit of a bootstrap paradox. Mm. The end. So uh, that's the recap. And uh, so let's talk about this one. What did you think of this, Father Corey? Uh, either on its own or as a second part right. to the first one. It, I guess it solves the first episode, but this was never one I really liked, you know, I mean, the two parter as a whole, yeah. um, it's not one of those I go back and watch. I did like the explanation of the bootstrap paradox at the beginning. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's cause that, that's a phrase that gets thrown around, but do people really understand it? And I'm sure Jimmy could give more critique about the explanation or, um, you know, explain in a little more detail, but I, you know, I think it was a, a fair explanation of why it's a paradox. Where does the, you know, where did the original Beethoven's music come from? If the time traveler doctor yep. <laughs> was Beethoven, you know, things or, like that. Right. Right. You or, know, or at it, least shared the Beethoven music that he knew. Right. 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 You know, so, so I think that, I mean, that was a good part of it. Um, but beyond that, um, it's an okay episode. We get some timey wimey fun stuff and you know, that the doctor, you know, kind of figuring things out and. And of course they throw in a little loot, you know, little, uh, switch bait and switch there too, with the, the, uh, mm -hmm. with the, the ghost doctor and things like that. But, oh, and, uh, I forgot to mention too, the, uh, intro music had Peter Capaldi playing the guitar. Yes. Yes. That was really nice. So there's a couple of things in there. I want, I do want to uh, dive a little deeper into, but, uh, in general, my, uh, overall, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I, when the first time I watched this, I, f I felt both episodes were a little confusing. I wasn't quite sure 
what was going on or how it was all solved. And I didn't understand the point of the Fisher King in general. Like I was looking for more about this. Mm -hmm. it, what is a fascinating character design? I mean, yeah. the character design of the Fisher King is wild, but I was like, why is he called the Fisher King? And like, I, I think uh, more than anything else that threw me because the Fisher King is a thing and we can get into what, what it is uh, again yep. in a bit, but the name of it, I think threw me enough that I wasn't, I, I kind of got lost. It, yeah. It, it, I think it was a mistake on the, on the part of the writers to, to name them that. Um, but overall, uh, I like the timey wimey stuff, like you said, and the bootstrap paradox and some of the relational stuff, the individual, there were some individual character moments that were okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but overall, like you said, these are not my two favorites of this season or of all, uh, you know, at all in general, they're, they're not terrible, but they're, they're kind of forgettable for me. I don't yeah. really. Uh, don't really love these ones. We, we complained about Toby Whithouse last week, so you can go listen to yeah. that if you want to hear why we think that. <laughs> right. So let's talk about that opening. And, and in a way, the opening is kind of fun. It's a, he, The doctor mm -hmm. breaks the fourth wall, talks directly to the audience. But it also feels a little like a, a cheat. Mm -hmm. Like, we've, we've written this poorly <laughs> so that people don't understand. Like, we, we, at the end, the doctor explicitly tells clara this is a bootstrap par paradox he yeah. right, comes, but then they have to take this time in the teaser at the opening to break the fourth wall and explain to us what a bootstrap paradox is and that just feels like bad writing to me uh, what do you think i, I agree i mean I, I like i said i like the explanation and i like how they did the explanation it's just the fact that they had to do it in the first place you yeah. know and and i wonder too if this is one of these hey we've got you know, a 40 minute episode and we've only got 38 minutes film. So let's take the first two minutes and talk about what we're doing in this episode, because it, it really was explicit of this is what a bootstrap par bootstrap paradox is. Oh, by the way, we are now in a bootstrap paradox. Right. Right. Yeah. There's this whole, like the explanation of, I mean, it designed to make you realize, uh, up front that it's going to be a bootstrap paradox. I mean, it's really, you know, pinning it to the wall. So. That was a little weird, a little, a little uh, odd, um, and making it a fourth wall break. I mean, other other than just saying this is what a bootstrap paradox is because we're in one. Nothing that goes on in that teaser has anything to do mm -hmm. with the rest of the episode. We don't really, like. It doesn't even really fit in the time. Like, when is he doing this? Is this just yeah. Peter Capaldi running around? Like, yeah, it's just kind of a weird thing. And I've always liked. Peter Capaldi's fourth wall breaks, where it is using the chalkboard or this with the guitar because they're fun. Yeah. They really are yeah. fun and they're interesting. Well, he's good at it. Yeah. He's good at it, you know, because he gets a little bit of his maniacal, maniacal Scotsman. spirit going. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but he's, he is, it's still the fact that they, they feel like with something like this, they had to throw it in there. That's, that's yeah. kind of the disappointing part. You mentioned the guitar playing that he plays the guitar over, you know, or along with the opening theme. That is, as we've mentioned many times, actually Peter Capaldi playing actual guitar. Yeah. Uh, he's a guitarist. And, and uh, by the way, did you notice that the amp was Megpie Electronics? Yes, that was nice. Every time we have a little uh, analog electronic thing on Doctor Who ever since that episode, the Idiot Lantern, was it? Yeah. Well, actually, um, it goes before. It started before, if I remember oh, right. Oh, really? I think, oh. no, maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Cause I want to say it showed up once like behind, like on a panel or something before. Okay. Okay. But th that is like sort of the de facto elect, you know, analog electronics manufacturer of the doctor who universe. That, that's, like, that's the, the Phillips or I, I can't remember. Yeah. I think Phillips is the one that's big and was or big Ma in the UK. Yeah. Or if Phillips is a, is a Dutch company. I'm pretty sure, but, uh, right. or Magnavox or we, you know, any of those, yep. those little Zenith. Wow. Not really giving my age now. Zenith. Oh Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, once we get past the opening, we we see the doctor talking to O'Donnell in the, uh, in this um, mock-up of a railway station in Scotland in 1980. And we should talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the setting. It's a kind of an interesting. The, it's an old Scottish or you know British military yeah. base in a, a valley in Scotland mm -hmm. um, that they, they they've built a mock-up of a of a Soviet town, a Russian town for training purposes, evidently. Yep. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And it, it was known that this was done. This was done on both sides. The Russians oh yeah. had mock up American towns. In fact, there's was it the, the experts was the movie with, I think it was John Travolta 
that they were Americans who were brought to this Soviet town to make it more American. Oh. And of course, you know, with the obvious, you know, Americanism wins over Sovietism, you know, type of message. But, right. but you know, that it was known that, and it, it, it's understandable, military is going to try to train as close to the real environment as they can. If the yeah. UK mil- military, if the US military had to go fight in Russia, they want to know what they're looking at. You know, right. even down to the point of basic things like how to read street signs in Cyrillic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Especially in the pre GPS days where, you know, mm-hmm. you know, map reading was a, a thing you had to do, you know, with a yeah, map it and it wasn't fed to you. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't until the nineties that GPS came out and first for the military and then eventually for everyone mm-hmm. else. So, yeah. So when, when the doctor tells O'Donnell that this is 1980, she goes, oh, this is pre Harold Saxon, which is the, mm-hmm. the master as the, as the prime minister of Britain. Yep. Pre moon egg or, or dragon baby. Oh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> moon egg. Let's go with that. And then pre minister of war where the doctor goes, how do you know about, th- oh, okay. never mind. Like he, so he recognizes minister of war. I'm like, do we ever have no, that? No, no, no. He said, I'll find out about that later. Oh, that's what it is. That's what it is. And I, I looked it up and apparently that is a, uh, a story that never got made per se, although it's the, um, the TARDIS wiki references a third doctor, big finish audio story hmm. that would be built off of this reference called the same face. But uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's not a, um, it's not a dramatized. It's not like actors. Uh, it has one person reading this story. It's more of they an audio book. Sounds like. Yeah. Them. Yeah. They have a, they have a series of short. Uh, I was going to say short tracks, but not uh, like short doctor <laughs> stories. Um, but, but so I don't know if they was, they were planning to do something else or if it was just supposed to be cryptic all along. So I just thought that was I'm, kind of interesting. I'm, you know, that, that's one thing about doctor who you, sometimes you can't ever tell if these are like actual plans they have going forward. Or if these are, eh, let's just throw something out and, you know, somebody can, yeah. Big Finish can fill it in later. Uh, it could also be Toby Whithouse angling for another uh, writing job. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Um, so I, I kind of liked it. Um, O'Donnell. She's another female unit fangirl of the Doctor. Oh, yeah. Kind of reminds of Oswald a little bit. And they're all doomed. <laughs> Did you ever yeah. notice that? <laughs> yeah. What is, what is with it? Why do they kill them off? I, it's kind of an interesting. Because tick. They, they give us a character that we like and then they kill it. Cause I, I love that where she's like, I'll catch up. I, I got something in my boot. It's bigger yeah. on the inside. It's bigger on the inside. <laughs> that was so much fun. <laughs> that, and uh, she seems to have you know all the trivia. Like she's, uh, you know, um, because uh, Bennett was throwing up from time travel and the dog's like, Oh, yep. it does, does that sometimes. And she's, you know, somehow I doubt that Rose or Martha or Amy lost their breakfast on their first trip. You know? So she knows <laughs> the companions. Um, although she doesn't say Clara, which is interesting. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. So, so there's th- th- that opening sequence and then they meet the Tivoli, uh, Tivolian funeral director, uh, Prentice. Yep. Um, who <sighs> it's interesting how the, the doctor and Bennett both kind of disdain Tivolians, like, oh, a, a, a race I kind of really don't like. And you know what? I don't like them either. Like, no. just, they're weird. Like, they, the, their craving of oppression and enslavement, it's uncomfortable, yeah. frankly. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's, it not, it's, let's, let's, I'm trying to say it's, it's understandable why they never took off. Why the yeah. only place we see him are these two Toby Whithouse stories. Cause there's yeah. the race that he created. And they're just not an interesting race. I mean, now we know why the guy was wearing the, you know, the top hat and suit, but right. It's just like, it's not, yeah. It's like, oh, it was so terrible. We weren't being enslaved yet. So we, we forced them to enslave us. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's really? Just, it's uncomfortable. It's kind of awkward and weird. And, and I, I just don't like it. Yeah. And it's, and it, well, I'll make you a deal. If you want, if you're going to enslave me, I'll we'll make it easy for you. It's like, you know, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's not the same thing, but there's an idea that it, that is kind of con- uh, connected to in Star Trek Discovery, Saru's people who are mm. um, they're a prey species that they've yep. evolved to sense when they're being stalked or when death is near and all that sort of stuff, which is s- similar but but very different and makes them not as <laughs> creepy or 
like unlikable, frankly. Mar- mark this on the calendar. This is a day where we can give Discovery some credit that <laughs> Saru's species is much better than yeah. Tivolian's. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it was, I guess it would be one thing if you resign to the fact that you're always going to be conquered. You know, you're never going to be a right. strong species that's going to be able to rise up and take control, take your control of yourself. That's one thing. And you can do that and be happy in that life. Sure. But to do it where you're almost gleeful for the next conquerors to come in. Right. It is very, yeah, it is very weird. So I, I do like his business card. I don't know if you, you have paused to look at the business card, but it has a slogan mm. on it. Um, you know, apprentice, funeral, uh, universal funeral director. And then at the bottom has the, his slogan, may the remorse be with you, which I just thought was <laughs> a Star Wars reference there. That's oh, yeah. Me. You should get a business card that you hand out when you do funerals, Father, when you show up. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, right. May the remorse <laughs> be with you. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe no. not. No, no, uh, that's that's quite all right. Yeah. Uh, so the doctor eventually calls Clara on the uh, the the super phone that looks like an iPhone five, and they they mm-hmm. FaceTime. I do like the fact that he turned the monitor on the TARDIS console sideways <laughs> to get it in portrait mode, just like you do with the FaceTime thing. Yeah, uh, that was good. That was good. And he kept um, going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it was weird because he gets to see his ghost hanging around, which we'll find out is not actually ghost and is yep. the bootstrap paradox. Um, and it's also how Moffat gets out of, you know, killing anyone. Um, I was going to say, we can't, we can't blame Moffat for this one though. I don't think this, this, this had to be Toby Whithouse doing this one. Well, I mean, it's interesting because so this, the doctor and Clara have this exchange and she's like, you, you are, you cannot die. The doctor seems resigned to his inevitable death. Like this yep. must be my death. And Clara refuses. She says, um, not with me, die with whoever comes after me. You do not leave me. And he mm-hmm. says, we have to face death eventually, be it ours or someone else's, which yeah. except we don't, <laughs> not, yeah. not when Moffat's in charge, no exactly. one dies with Moffat, even well, Clara. We've got the secondary characters who died, but right, right, as always, but, but but no one important, right, right, yeah, and, and like you said, you know, spoiler for the end of the season, you know, ten years ago or fifteen years ago, whenever this <laughs> yeah. was, uh, yeah. that Clara doesn't really die; she's almost dead, right? She's between heartbeats or whatever, which is a cheat because that means which, you're not dead. <laughs> yeah, I was, well, I was going to say, if you're between heartbeats, that's called dead. <laughs> your heart right. is not actively beating you're dead but <laughs> right obviously right. this is a time lock or you know whatever they i can't remember the what they said yeah yeah and in fact we get to meet a shoulder uh next episode next week. by the way mm. there's a as a preview um and the next time we talk about the 12th doctor anyway um but it is interesting that like he he's counseling clara you know we all have to face death and clearly clara is still grieving danny that's mm-hmm. that's why she's like this and in fact at the end she gives a, gives some counsel to Bennett, who is grieving O'Donnell, yep. and in you know about not not so much accepting death, but just accepting the reality of what right. has happened, and you know, and and but accepting the good things that you remember and that sort of stuff. Yeah, because so, he was ready to go back in there and to die her, die with her. Yes, yeah, that it doesn't say explicitly, but it's clearly he was contemplating opening that door and going inside, yeah. although. There's nothing in there to kill him with, right? Like what would in the Faraday cage? How would they? Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Uh, again, that's one of those things that I don't think they thought that quite so through. through, (laughs) Maybe you would grab something and went in. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. So the, the ghost of the doctor, the hollow ghost is reciting the names of the people who die in order. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it will turn out that not, Everyone on that list dies. In fact, uh, he he lists. Although it's interesting, Prentice is listed after Moran and Pritchard, and before O'Donnell. Mm-hmm. But I guess he only really. That's right. But, but Pritchard was dead when they showed up, right? He was the first ghost. So you know. Well, he so was. He, he was. He, he's doing it out of order. The order in which the doctor has lived it. There. That's yeah. That's the point because according from the doctor's point of view. He meets Pritchard and then Pritchard dies or apprentice, but yes, apprentice, excuse me, Prentice, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, uh, um, confusing when you got Pritchard, who is the company guy and then Prentice, who's the, the mortician. Right. And you know, that order, like 
once O'Donnell di- one, once O'Donnell dies, Bennett accuses the doctor of sacrificing O'Donnell to test mm-hmm. his theory of the that it was in the order of death. And but that's not exactly what the doctor was doing, was he? Like no. he tried to get O'Donnell to stay behind in the TARDIS because he suspected that's what the list was. Yep. But do you think he realized at that point that O'Donnell's death was inevitable, but Clara's wasn't? Well, he even says that he realizes when he set up this paradox, however he set up this paradox, um, that he purposely put Clara's next so that he would make the effort to go save her. Right, because that's what would be necessary to to get him to do the things he did that results right. in the paradox being created. Right. Exactly. Um, but the doctor does get accused of this on occasion, especially in new who of sort of being mm-hmm. callous about the death of secondary people that he's just yeah. met as opposed to primary companions that he feels like he has a, a duty of care for. And the mm-hmm. doctor can be kind of bloodless a bit like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, even going back to, to old who you can see so much of, uh, where the, the, all, everybody else is expendable except the doctor and companions. And there are episodes where literally the doctor and companions are the only ones surviving. Yes. Yes. I think, yeah, we've run into those and that's, that was true with the fourth doctor. I remember the seventh yep. doctor, even the sixth doctor, I think, but I yeah, think it all, well, in the beginning, not so much first doctor, second doctor, not so much just because, you know, it wasn't as much, it death. was seen yeah. as more as a kid's show. So they wouldn't right. want where the doctor and companions land on this spaceship and everybody, everybody gets wiped out except the doctor and companions. <laughs> you wouldn't want to show that to kids. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, it is interesting. The, yeah. The, and, but the doctor is seen as, and it's, I think especially the 12th doctor is seen as kind of willing to sacrifice lives. Whereas the 13th doctor swings in the other direction. She mm-hmm. really, you know, can't, can't lose the fam, can't lose anybody, yeah. you know? And, um, and it's, it's interesting how the, the doctor kind of swings back and forth between well, these extremes. I mean, look at the ninth doctor where the, the, uh, the child, uh, where the, um, the world war two one, where they get the, they become, are you my mummy? Yes. And right. And that where he rejoices because no one died. Everybody was healed. Right, right. From, Everyone lives. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there are times when he is more willing to sacrifice people, and there are times when he rejoices because he didn't have to. Right, right. So um, the doctor does, as a result of O'Donnell's death and realizing Clara's next, or thinking Clara's next, uh, tries to jump back to the future, you know, the, the, the course of history be danged, you know, I'm going to save her, whether you know, one way or the other. And he can't, the TARDIS won't let Mm -hmm. him, the cloister bell rings. And in fact, loops him back to a half hour before when, (laughs) uh, you know, the, you know, he, when he arrived with Bennett and O'Donnell and they're still alive. And that, that is an interest. I like that part because it creates this interesting tension for Bennett, who Mm -hmm. I could say, like, just like the doctor wants to save Clara, he could save, uh, O'Donnell, but the doctor won't let him. Yeah. Including literally tackling him. Yeah. I love that. Uh, it's just, he, he starts moving. The doctor just jumps and drops him on the ground. And that's where the doctor gets the sleeve torn or the shoulder torn that he sees it, in his ghost. Yeah. And O'Donnell, I mean, Bennett kind of accuses the doctor, like you're willing to break the rules to save Clara, but you won't let me break the rules to save O'Donnell. Because if he mm-hmm. saves O'Donnell, that creates a, a different paradox that, that, maybe won't let him save Clara. So it's right. kind of interesting. It's goes back to that where he's kind of willing to sacrifice maybe. Yeah. Well, it, it's, I mean, of course they always throw in the, well, he's a time Lord and he can see all time and space. And, you know, he knows exactly what his actions are going to do. And, and when he does try to throw that out, it doesn't work for him anyways. So right. Like the TARDIS not letting him go back to the 22nd century. Right. He never lets Bennett in on what his plan is. And I get that from dramatic reasons. Like we don't want to let the audience, you know, we want the audience to be surprised at the end, but from a internal logic, uh, it, it, I mean, I guess it's just makes it's, it's something the doctor always does is he comes up with these plans and executes them without telling anyone, but it just seems unnecessarily cryptic. (laughs) Yeah. And like you said, that that's, that's common, especially in new, but 
at least, you know, some of the better written episodes will do the, so let me tell you what we're going to do. And yeah. it flashes to the next scene. So at least the, the companions got the plan. Right. Even if we didn't. True. So, uh, meanwhile, back in the 22nd century, Clara and Cass and Lun have hidden in the Faraday cage, but left the phone, her iPhone outside, yep. um, so that it can get the signal. Cause it, I mean, I don't know if we've ever explained a Faraday cage. Uh, they kind of explain in, in the show, mm -hmm. I guess. But a Faraday cage is a c construction that blocks all electromagnetic re uh, radiation, which includes radio yep. signals and any other electrical or magnetic field. Um, it's a shield, basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have them today. They're, 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 yeah. they're common. Um, yeah, and they're, you know, they're as simple as a metal box, and they're, you know, cars mm -hmm. can be a Faraday cage. That's why you have the antennas on the outside of the car, not inside the car. <laughs> because it will block your radio, you know, if you actually, you know, satellite radio or radio stations, the car itself will block the signal, things like that. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever been inside a building where you couldn't get your a cell signal, that, that's, it's kind of acting like a Faraday gauge. Yep. Uh, so, um, so that's what it is. So they put the phone outside and then the ghost of O'Donnell comes and takes the phone like, darn it. Oh yeah. <laughs> totally and, didn't see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, <laughs> totally wouldn't see that. Um, and this is when Clara finally realizes what we've all realized, which is that um, Lun, he's the sign language interpreter for Cass, who's deaf. Lun mm -hmm. is immune to the ghosts. They won't harm him because he hasn't seen the writing, literally seen the writing on the wall in the yep. spaceship. And thus he doesn't have it inside him and thus is, would not make a trans, be able to be killed and turned into a soul transmitter or whatever the, right. the, the, the MacGuffin is in this. Um, so she wants to send him out to get the phone back. And Cass who accuses her of being like the doctor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in being willing to sacrifice others. And Clara admits he taught her to do what has to be done. Yeah. She admits I'm willing to sacrifice his life to, to, you know, to put his life at risk anyway. Yeah. To, to do what needs to be done. Well, and she, she flat out asks, Cass asks through translation, um, did he change you? you yeah. Know, basically, you, were you always like this? Or is this something that happened with traveling with the doctor? And of course, that's, again, that's something we see in New Who so much is they're questioning that. You know, how, did, how has the interaction with the doctor changed the companion? Right. And in fact, that's kind of the question for the season, right? I mean, that by the end of the season, when Clara departs, it's because she does what she does with in face the Raven because she's been changed so much by the doctor, mm -hmm. you know, and she's become sort of, you know, like the Dr. Clara, you know, yep. remember like with the Dr. Donna. So, uh, Cass is right. And she's, she sees something there. Uh, but she does promise Cass he'll be all right because the ghost won't touch him, which then leads the you know we have a nice little bit of uh misdirection here then we see the suspended animation chamber activating mm -hmm. and and for us who if we haven't seen it before we think well, that's the fisher king inside there waking from yep. a suspended animation that puts lun in danger um exactly. so it ups the drama a little bit there although uh, they you know they they redo the countdown twice so i mean it's like okay i mean that i think that was an editing issue yeah they kind of made a mistake there it also yeah i mean They've, they've raised the stakes. It's not just the lives of the people on the base at, at risk, mm -hmm. too. I mean, we, we, we get this whole thing like, oh, no, it's an invasion force. That's what we're yep. calling is the, uh, the Fisher King's people to come and invade. Um, and that's what the, you know, when the doctor goes to confront the Fisher King, that's what he says is the ghosts are going to bring an armada to conquer Earth. Um, yep. And uh, they have a, a discussion between the doctor and the fisher king with the fisher king kind of accuses the time lords of becoming the most warlike species in the galaxy or in the universe um yeah. sort of critic critiquing the the time lords which yeah is going back to the time war you know yeah um, where they're willing to destroy everything to stop the daleks and almost did it's that's one of the interesting things that doctor who has done from the beginning is the doctor's people have never been the heroes. They're not the Federation. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, you know, the, the idealistic or the, 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 the superhero sort of race. They've always been somewhat mixed. It's a little somewhat mm -hmm. black, and, black and white and gray, uh, which yeah. is interesting. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, even going back to their earliest uh, appearances, they were pretty 
I, I'm trying to think of the word to use, but basically they, they just kind of, they were there and yep. they dealt with their own issues and some were good. Was, some were bad. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Some, but you, you yeah. know, even when it was just like, they were there, <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's really all you can say about them. You know, yeah. the, first, you know, the, the regeneration episode from the second doctor, at the end of war machines, the, uh, the third, three doctors, same kind of thing. They were just there, right. you know, and right. the doctor had to save their butt. Yes. And, and you know, some, sometimes they use the doctor to, to, to accomplish their ends, you know, in, in a ways mm-hmm. that would seem not quite moral or ethical even. Um, and you know, and, and, but, but people have, you know, different time lords had different, you know, good and bad and that sort of thing. So yep. I just, I do like the fact that doctor who's always kind of not made them out to be, you know, they're, they're more advanced. Therefore they're better than us. You know, they right. they actually are still fairly, like humans in, in that some, sense. Some of them think they are, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it, so Cl- Clara and Cass go looking for Lund when he doesn't return quickly. Cause he gets trapped in the, uh, cafeteria, mm-hmm. the, 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 the dining yep. hall. And so they go looking for him when he doesn't come back and get separated. I do like the fact that like Clara, when Clara notices that Cass has been separated from her, she's like, starts calling out her Cass, Cass, and then stops and goes, Oh, I'm an idiot. Yeah. Because Cass is deaf. She can't hear her calling yeah. her. Well, and, and they did a really clever thing with this is when Cass is being followed by the ghost of Moran and yeah. he's dragging the, the ax course, we can hear it. But then when they show just her, all you hear yeah. is like a little bit of static. Yes. A little bit of background noise, white noise. But then she puts her hand down and touches the floor and it, you could, you hear the vibrations. Yes. That and was actually well done. I, I really I did like that. that. That was really well done. So I did mention that we would talk about you know, what the Fisher King really was. And so mm-hmm. f- the Fisher King before Dr. Who was an, a figure in Arthurian legend who was supposed to. I thought you were talking about the Robin Williams movie. I mean, well, no. also the Robin Williams movie who was supposed no. to the last keeper of the Holy Grail, uh, mm-hmm. which was the cup of Christ and, you know, that at the, from the last supper. Yep. Um, and he was wounded and then so he the legendary king waits a guy got this off of i think the tardis wiki uh mm-hmm. legendary king waits for someone who is able to heal him to arrive so mm-hmm. in some way the fisher king is in this and doctor who is waiting for someone from his people to come and save him but right. i don't know i just don't understand why they chose the fisher king as his name yeah and he was known as the fisher king before his death quote unquote because he really didn't die yeah you know and so i i don't get what that connection was supposed to be you know other than the possibly you know, like he actually was injured and the call was for people to come and save yeah. him it's just i don't know really, it's really weird <laughs> i just yeah it was a weird choice i yeah i don't i don't get it because yeah, because I mean, you look at, uh, of course, my thought is you talk about, you know, the Holy Grail, and of course, it's Indiana Jones right. in the Last Crusade with the, the, the knight who is guarding it. Yeah. But, he chose but, uh, holy. <laughs> yep. But I, I don't know. I, I honestly yeah. don't know why they picked that one because he definitely yeah. doesn't fit the character of the Fisher King as you described it. Right. It just, I mean, it's not a huge deal. It just threw me off. Like, I think that's, it was this, by choosing that as the name for him, I was, I had that when you choose a name from legend that people would know, then right. you expect it to have to, to be connected to that somehow f- internally, internally to the story. And I don't, and, and it wasn't there. And so it kind of, I, I spent, I remember the first time I watched this, I spent the whole time wondering when is this going to connect? And that kind of made my understanding and enjoyment of the story less. So it's, that's, I mean, I don't want to, you know, to try that yeah, to, I don't- to death, but. Um, so that's what <laughs> the know. point I'm trying to get on that. Um, so, so the doctor bluffs the Fisher King. He tells him that um, the the doctor has nothing left to lose. So he got rid of the words so that they so that they won't contaminate mm-hmm. his friends in the future. Like he's changed the future, and I I've got nothing yep. to lose, so I've changed the future. I've broken all the rules, and uh, the the Fisher King then rushes out to go and see if the doctor is telling the truth to to see it. But when he gets outside, then that's when we see the the doctor has taken the power cell out of the spaceship, the one that was missing last yep. episode, and blown up the dam to cause the flood that floods the valley and thus 
closes the loop on that part of right. the time the time uh, line in the future. Uh, exactly. So uh, the TARDIS executes security protocol seven one two with Bennett inside, yep. which is nice. Uh, we've seen that before, haven't we? Where there's like an emergency um, mm-hmm. uh, dematerialization. Yeah, we, we've we've seen the the was it they call it the had system. We've seen that. We've seen right. uh, you know emergency protocols where the doctor appears as a hologram and says, "I'm you know I'm taking you somewhere else." Uh, we saw it, like Blink was one episode where we saw that. Where yeah, actually the TARDIS dematerialized around Sarah. Right, right. Sally, Sally, Sally. Yeah. Uh, this so is, we, we have seen that before. I like that. Yeah. You know, please stow all your handbag, hand luggage. <laughs> Prepare for departure. <laughs> I did like that. And so the doctor then, yeah. it turns out, jumped into the suspended animation chamber right there, in, you mm-hmm. know, where he'd been confronting the Fisher King. And so the doctor took the long way around, as they say, yep. for a couple hundred years, spent his time in the chamber. Uh, this season, the doctor, I think the doctor's lifespan has been extended more than all the other, I mean, presumably in um, hell bent and heaven sent to the beginning of next season. It's, it's, it's like supposed to be like a billion years or something. Yeah. But, um, well, don't forget Matt Smith's with um, 2000 years or whatever it was. He was traveling between. Right. Dropping right. Far off and coming back. True. Or, uh, true. Matt, uh, Amy and Amy and Amy and Rory. I mean, right. That's true. That's true. That's that one too. Yeah. Um, and when Amy, we get back to, when we get back to hell, Hellbent heaven sent. I've got a lot of complaints about that idea that it was billions of years that the doctor spent. I know that is, there's a, yeah, that's problematic. We'll get there. Yep. <laughs> um, so, and that's when we get it revealed that the, what the, the whole, uh, shtick is the ghost doctor was not the real ghost of the doctor, but was a hologram with a bit of AI in it. And it, let's hear holographic AI doctor where have we heard that before <laughs> hmm. uh, pl- please activate the emergency medical hologram, medical hologram. <laughs> um and so the doc the ghost doctor's list of names the referring to the chamber program and then the programming the ghost is all the bootstrap paradox as the doctor yeah. explains to amy, uh, amy clara at the end and you know kind of leads her to it like so why did i give it that list because I heard it give me the list through yep. you in that whole sort of thing. So when uh, did I create the hologram and give the yeah. list in the first place? Yes. And this is the problem with time travel, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> the paradox. And it's, it's one of the few times that Dr. Who has explicitly looked at paradoxes that are created, you know, and of course they, they yeah. do the, uh, the fixed point in time to try to over, to, to get around some of that, but still, yep. And we do get that uh, fourth wall break right at the very end where he, he you know, he says, uh, exactly, who composed Beethoven's fifth? And then looks directly at the camera and mm-hmm. shrugs, you know, and so yep. and, that, and that's that. So uh, anything I missed? Any other notes you wanted to add to that? Uh, I think, yeah, I think that was it. We covered about everything I got. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, we would like to, before we go, take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including John W., Blaze G., Hunter H., David B., and a special thank you to Sophie R. from Fargo. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who in all the shows at StarQuest, and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edited this episode. So that's it from us this time. What did you think of Before the Flood and Under the Lake? Let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page or send an email to Who at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You can watch The Secrets of Doctor Who on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia where you can also leave comments. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the second Doctor story, The Dominators. Until then, Father Corey Stephen, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bethanelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, you can't cheat time. You can't just go back and cut off tragedy at the root because you find yourself talking to someone you just saw dead on a slab. This thing you really do see ghosts.